Amen. Now, the fruit is the weakness, and it is the target, and it is the weakest point of any plant. It is attacked by all kinds of things. In the case of grapes, there's yeast upon it that is trying to change it from grape juice into wine. There are insects, there are worms that attack it, there are birds, there are animals, and they all target it. Deuteronomy 28, 39 says, The vineyards of the grapes, the worms shall eat them. And then the Song of Songs 2, 15 says that the little foxes spoil the vines of the tender grapes. And then, of course, we have the famous passage about trampling out the vintage, if you will, uh, both found in uh, Revelation 14 and then Isaiah 63. Julia Howe uh, took that statement and wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And uh, even a, a book that was pretty famous way back in the 40s, The Grapes of Wrath, based upon that. But the idea is that the grapes are trampled, that they're the target. But that makes you wonder, is weakness really a weakness? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, we all know this passage, beginning in verse 9, it says, My grace is sufficient for you, talking to Paul, who had been praying that this thorn in the flesh would be uh, healed or whatever. And he would prayed three times very sincerely about it. It says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Is not anyone without weaknesses? Is there anybody? And if you think you are, uh, then I'd have to say probably you're clueless or you're closed off or you're disconnected or you're arrogant or you're lonely or you're frustrated with others or maybe even I could go so far as to say you may even be dangerous. Is not anyone who cannot or does not acknowledge or accept and try to deal with their weakness is really out of touch with themselves and with others. Strangely enough, there are actually real benefits from having weaknesses that you know. And if you don't know your weaknesses, you need to get acquainted with them because without knowing these benefits of weaknesses, you might not be as good a person as you could be. Knowing your weakness is a form of protection. If you don't know where your weak points are, you can't protect yourself as well. Uh, it tells you what you shouldn't do, what you should not try. For example, creative people are generally not considered very good organizers. So if you're very creative, you're often not known for your organizational skills. Organizational people, on the other hand, are usually not known for their creativity. Now I know you may think you can do both and you're the unusual person and so if you can do both, you probably don't do either one as good as either a creative person or an organizational person. That's just the way it really is. So creatives uh, need to learn to embrace organizers and organizers need to learn to embrace creatives. It will actually end up protecting you both, it'll expand you both and you'll be frustrated less. Knowing your weakness also opens your heart to receive help. If you don't know you have weaknesses, then you're less likely to ask for help. People who never ask for help are people who aren't even aware that they have weaknesses. And you don't give another person an opportunity. It expands your life to go to somebody and say, you know, I really could use some help. It will make a difference in your life in a positive way if you can give in to that and what you might be able to accomplish that you're not accomplishing now because you can't even accept that you might need help. And knowing your weaknesses help you to honor the strengths of other people. By doing that, you actually give a place for the other person to shine. You affirm their strengths by accepting that you have weaknesses. When you walk up to someone and you tell them, 
I'm really not very good at this, and I know you are. Could you help me? I, then, you know, I got to tell you, that won't make anybody upset that you bragged on them in that way. In fact, it will make them feel really good about who they are. Our weaknesses let others know that they matter and that they can, um, it actually makes us far more tolerable. If you never tell anybody where you're weak, you're less tolerable because it actually gets on other people's nerves, especially if you really are that perfect. <laughs> you, you will actually be more likable if you can accept that there are some areas where you are weak. Acknowledge them, accept them, and deal with them. Some weaknesses enhance your strengths. Now that may sound strange, but it is true. For example, uh, let's just say that you are a creative and you love learning and you're very honest and you're very curious. Those things kind of go together. But also with that, usually a creative person lacks prudence at times. They will take an undue risk because they're so creative. They'll try something that you'd be saying, whoo, I wouldn't do that. They'll paint a picture that you'd say, whoa, that doesn't fit into culture. And so they'll try those kind of risks. But being willing to take a risk actually pays off in other fields. For example, if you need to be a coach and you're a creative and you're a coach, you need to be able to tell the guys you're coaching you're doing it wrong. Whereas if you're not a creative or the person to be willing to take that risk, you're not so willing to tell somebody they're doing it wrong. And as a result, they'll never do it right and you'll never be as good a coach as you could be. And for example, if you're not willing to tell people that they're doing it wrong, you probably don't need to be in ministry, <laughs> you know? And so that makes me very popular. So, uh, that was a joke. So I wanna give you three reasons that I found, uh, particularly, that fruit is actually our weakness. It doesn't represent our strength, but it represents our weakness. Number one, fruit is weak and can make no deception at all. It says in verse 43, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Can, fruit simply cannot fake you out. It cannot camouflage. It cannot lie and say, I'm a grape when I'm really an apple. It cannot deceive the predators around it. Apple trees, in fact, it goes further than that. Fruit identifies the plant, not vice versa. You don't say there's an apple on that uh, bark tree. You know, you don't do that. Uh, it identifies the tree itself. Matthew 7, 15 and 16 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. So you know it's an apple tree because it has apples. You know it's an orange tree because it has oranges on it. The fruit identifies the plant, not vice versa. So there's no way to deceive what it is and what the plant is, even before seeing the fruit. Fruit has an aroma, and the aroma identifies the plant. So you don't actually have to see. If, you're, if you've been around them enough, you can tell what kind of plant it is and what kind of fruit it is from the smell. The Song of Songs uh, 2 and 13 says, the fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes gives a good smell. You can smell when it's about to happen. So there are indicators of what it is, little less, so you can't deceive. Fruit can't hide what it is. It can't hide what tree it represents. So that's a weakness. But that weakness is actually a strength. When I'm weak or where I'm weak, there I'm strong. Isaiah 53 verse 9 says, Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. So a sinless sacrifice is required. If, if you want to know the real truth, the real truth is not being able to deceive is the strength. And what it's suggesting is, is the results of your life, because that's what your fruit is, can't deceive anybody. Are you following me? If we see a certain behavior, that's who you are. 
For example, you don't come Sunday night, that defines you. You don't come Thursday night, it defines you. If you come those times, it defines you. You cannot hide who you are. You are your fruit. So literally, it's a strength. But it appears to be a weakness to those who are predators. Second little trait. And that is, fruit is weak and can make no defense of itself, or at least to any degree. In this text, it says, verse 44, For every tree is known by its own fruit, for men do not gather figs from thorns. You don't go up to a thorn bush. You ever seen a thorn tree? Don't try to climb a thorn tree. There are a lot of thorn trees in Africa. Let me tell you something. I mean, there's a lot of thorn trees. Scary. Thorns this long, okay? And the tree's full of them. <laughs> then there's the gotcha tree where you just get close to it, it grabs you. So, I mean, it's bad. Uh, they've got grass over there that's terrible too. Now, I did run into some of that devil's thorn grass. We have some of that in Florida. Anybody ever stepped on devil's thorn grass? Where it grabs you? Anybody? No? Yes? No? Well, you'll know it when you step on it. It grabs you from about six different directions simultaneously. And you have to sit down and pull that out from about, and it's, I saw it over in Cocoa Beach. That's where I stepped on some. It was really fun. So, and figs from thorns, nor do they gather, I'd only run into it in Africa, but apparently somebody's brought it here. Nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. Uh, now, Bramble bush do have some fruit on them. Uh, fruit cannot really, though, protect itself for the most part. It cannot really offend. It cannot really defend. It can't even really hinder or stop the predators around it from eating it. Uh, grapes are valuable, though, because that's true. If grapes were inside of a nut, inside of another nut, inside of another nut, and each grape had a, a wall on it that was two feet thick, I wouldn't be eating any grapes, would you? I'd just be like, and if there were thorns all over them, I probably wouldn't be eating a whole lot of grapes either. So, I mean, it actually enhances their value. Now, there are blackberries. Bears like blackberries. I mean, they're out there, and there are wild berries, and you can go pick them that have thorns on them, but for the most part, we don't raise those things much. People don't generally raise those. There are people who do, but not many people raise those things, and it's a bit of a prickly thing to mess with. Now, Matthew 7 and verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And you don't. Grapes do not have sharp, hurtful, harmful thorns nor hard shells to hinder predators that would eat them. Uh, if you have that situation, you're going to end up being eaten. Uh, so uh, grapes or fruit without thorns are considered not only that they are the thing you want to raise because they don't have those things, but because they don't have thorns, they're actually considered, according to Scripture, blessed. You see, bless, uh, blessing falls upon things that don't have thorns. Thorns represent the curse. The thorns are the sign of God's curse on the earth. Genesis chapter 3, beginning of verse 17. Then to Adam, he, that is God, said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, and both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Now, I don't know if that's a new plant that God had just created or that he suddenly caused plants to have thorns and thistles. I don't know. It's one of those two, though. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And he's saying not only are you going to have to sweat really hard for it, but things are going to work against you and gouge you while you're doing it. And if you've done any work out there, you've come home scraped up from, from priors and other things. Grapes, on the other hand, do not offend that way. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32, give no offense. And it didn't say give some offense. 
it says give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Our goal when we produce our fruit is to not offend. We are not to be the thorns of this world. We are not to be the bramble bush. We're to be the grapes. And like Abram, we are to be a blessing. We talked about that this morning. So we are to be a blessing to those around us. We are to go out of our way to not offend. Now, you can go out of your way to not offend people and they can still be offended. I mean, if somebody just wants to be offended, you can't fix that. But there's the thing you need to get in the middle of all that. So we're, we, we are to be people without defense. See, when you run into somebody that they're prickly and every time you say something to them, they're back at you. Okay, did I wake anybody up? It's open. Some of you look like you're about to fade, so I thought I'd try something to get you back in it. If, if that's the type of person you are, that you can't take criticism, that you have to bite back, that's not a great, that's not a great, sometimes you need to just listen, right? Amen? And quit biting. You bite, you keep biting, you will end up devouring each other, right? Galatians 5.15, I believe that's true. So what, the weakness is actually a strength. See, being attacked without attacking back is a spiritual strength. Some people think you're weak because you won't bite back. No, 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 no. Anybody can bite back. That just shows you've got anger issues. But if someone can take you down a notch or two and you accept it and you quietly think about it, that's spiritual strength. And it shows... A couple of things. If you can do that, it shows that you have the testimony of the Lord. It shows you you have the Spirit of God. And it shows that you have the promise of heaven. Where did I get all of that? Listen to this scripture. Luke 21, you might want to turn to it. Luke 21, 12 through 19. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you. Now, by the way, persecute does not mean beat up. You actually know what the word means. The actual word means pursue. That's all it means means to pursue you, to be after you, to get, get something on you or do something to you. That's the reason, the meaning of the original word. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogue and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Hmm. Therefore settle it in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. Don't try to be too smart. If you oversmart yourself, you'll undersmart God. It's better to not think too hard about what you're going to say. Verse 15 says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, so God will fill you with His Spirit, and you will say what needs to be said. And if you don't think of anything to say, that's what needs to be said. Are you listening? If you trust God, right? If you trust God, that's what needs to be said. So I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Well, I believe you're always supposed to answer back. Really, have you ever heard of Jesus? He was dumb before the shearers, so he opened not his mouth. Sometimes the best thing to say is absolutely nothing. And let them say what they want to say. And then he says, verse 16, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. That's real persecution. Verse 17, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now verse 18, But not a hair of your head shall be lost. You're not going to be lost. So that's the promise of God. So it basically says you have an opportunity for testimony, which means you have the testimony of the Lord. You will be led of the Spirit, which means you have the Spirit of God. And you won't be lost. That means that you're going to heaven. You have the promise of God. So it really pays to not be somebody who bites back. It actually speaks worlds about you. So the fruit is the weakness and it can make no defense. The last weak thing I want you to pay attention to about fruit is fruit is weak and can make no decision. This is interesting. Look at verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure, you're still in the topic of fruit. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart, in this case the heart is basically where the fruit's coming from, brings forth good. And in that case, we've just been talking about good fruit. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil or evil fruit. 
for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. You say, well, I have free will. I can still make choices. But a fruit can't. Fruit cannot choose what kind of fruit it is. It can only become, it is the result of something else. Fruit cannot make a decision and become something different to save itself. Oh, here comes a bird. I'm going to pretend to be a leaf. You know, it can't do that. It cannot change itself. Good fruit cannot change its nature. Matthew 7, 17 and 18 says, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. It cannot decide to be different. It cannot make a decision. It is what it is. That's an important lesson. So the nature of good fruit is determined by what? It's determined by the seed and not by a choice. The seed determines it. Fruit is the result of other decisions in reaction to the seed, maybe you could say, but it's ultimately the result of the fruit of the seed itself. The seed forces the fruit, good, bad, or otherwise, to be what it is. That's where it comes from. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 38, it says, To each seed its own body. Every seed produces a body. It cannot choose that. This, the, uh, an orange seed cannot say, I think I'm going to become corn. It doesn't work that way. Wheat doesn't say, I think I'm going to be in a, a watermelon. It doesn't make a decision. The seed determines it. 1 Peter 1, 23, We're born again not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God. So when the Word of God has had its effect on you, you're the result. What you do is a result of the Word of God. That's good seed. And you can't change that. You can't say, oh, he listened to the Word of God and he did something evil. No, not because of the Word of God. He might have done something evil because it wasn't because of the Word of God. That's not possible. 1 John 3 verse 9, His seed remains in him and he cannot sin. That means to practice sin on and on. You just can't do that. If the Word of God's really having an impact upon you, you can't wallow in sin. You can sin, but you can't wallow in sin. Not if the Word of God's having an impact on you. But now, this weakness is actually a strength too. So it is a weakness. In other words, I really can't change who I am. I can't make a decision about that. So in a way, it appears to be a weakness. Somebody says, oh, so you can't be different? No. i got to be a Christian. Amen? I don't have a choice on that. Do you have a choice on that? I do not have a choice on that. I can't change that. We say, well, you could decide to be evil. Not listening to this. No. It's not possible. You say, yeah, you could. No. The fruit of that is a Christian. Amen? That's what it is. So what's the weakness? The weakness is actually a strength. We cannot change. We have been changed not by sheer human will, but by the grace of the seed and the spirit and the divine nature and the divine love that's been poured upon us. 2 Peter 1 verse 4, We are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have become partakers of that. I am not the person I was. The fruit that's happened to me is the divine nature, not the divine Dutton, because I assure you, left to myself, you would not want to, want to be around me. I'm just telling you straight up. That's just the way it is. But Romans 5 verse 5 says, The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God's love poured into us, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, Peace. That's the fruit. First fruit is the fruit of your lips. What do you say? If you talk blankety, 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 I'm telling you, the Word of God's not having a huge impact on you, right? The more the Word of God has an impact on you, the more this will change. The more then this will change, right? That's what happens, and we don't have a choice about it. The fruit is the weakness, and it can make no decision but the result of the seed is the fruit. Those are the simple little lessons today. You know, I love science. You might like science. Kind of, I love science. I can't get enough of it, really. Uh, I don't know if I made a slide on this. I don't, yeah, I did. Isn't that nice and appetizing? 
Now, there are uh, natural defenses that you cannot see. I know that may come strange. They don't have thorns. Fruit doesn't have thorns. And it doesn't appear to have any defense. So it's almost like a supernatural defense because you can't see it. You have to study it in very carefully in science to even know it. For example, and, and it defends itself, not against us. It looks like it's defended so that we can eat it. <laughs> That's what it looks like it is. But it defends itself, but not completely. It can't stop much. But it can do a little bit to defend itself. For example, the seed within itself is slightly uh, defensive in that you really don't want to eat the seed. I'm, I'm talking about like inside of fruit. Uh, the kernels uh, have these pits in them. Some fruits contain a natural toxin. I'm going to try to pronounce this. It's uh, gly, uh, glycoside. Wait a minute. No, that's not what it is. It's cyanogenetic glycoside. Cyanogenetic glycoside. That's the chemical. I don't, I don't know what that is. Bobby's over here going, oh, I'm going to. He's dumb. A dumb preacher trying to use a word. But Here's some plants that this appears in their seed. Apricots, or apricots, cherries, peaches, pears, plums, prunes. Now, the presence of glycogenic, no, cyanogenic glycoside is not dangerous in and of itself, but if you chew it, okay? So if you get a pear seed out and you start chewing it, this cyanogenic glycoside is transformed into hydrogen cyanide. And that's poisonous. Now, it won't kill you, likely. You'd have to eat a good bit of it. But it's not healthy. Don't be eating pear seeds, okay? So there is a slight thing there, but you have to grind it up for that to actually happen, for it to engage with you. The fruit itself, though, this is a new thing that they've just discovered, and I thought this was interesting. So fruit has its own preservative, if you will, I did not know this, but there's just a recent study. National Geographic funded this back in 2013. Jane J. Lee was one of the leaders in the study. And what they discovered is that fruit and vegetables are not dead that you buy in the grocery store. They are still alive. Okay? And they live for about a week. So when you eat them, you're putting live things in the fire. Don't you feel good about that? So it's kind of like lobster. So... Fruit and vegetables in the market still follow the circadian rhythm. And when they discovered this, what they've learned, since it follows the circadian rhythm, they have learned, you know, the circadian rhythm is the dark and light, right? And they said, and this is what Janet Brahm said, it says the plants or the fruit know when the insects eat them. So they prepare a defense during those hours. How about that? Isn't that interesting? So if you take the plants and if you want them to last longer and not allow bugs to eat them, okay, then what you want to do is keep them on the same dark light cycle that it was picked on. So if it's picked further north or whatever, keep it on the same dark light cycle. And they've done the experiments and it really works. It extends their protection against things like, let's see, one of the, it was a moth that they checked it on. It was, I don't know if I can pronounce the moth. It's a cabbage looper moth caterpillar. And they checked it on that. They've checked it on other things. And it really holds its chemical basis. Now, you could also enhance, apparently, the flavor of the vegetables based on this dark light cycle or the circadian cycle. And Jerry Glover of the Archaeological uh, Ecologist, the U.S. Agency for International Development, said this has some great potential to guide our thinking on how to manage pests better without such a high impact effect of using pesticides. So the idea is to protect it longer without having to put poisons on it. So, but the idea is, is that here's the thing. Nobody knew this. Nobody had really aware that this actually was going on. 
And so it's kind of an invisible miracle that's happening all this time. And nobody actually knew it. It lasts for about the time you keep the vegetables or the fruits around until you decide to eat them. And so they're actually trying to protect themselves against worms and the like. So here's what that said to me is that God defends us. It isn't really the seed defending us. It's not really the plant defending us. It's something that God built into the system. That God defends the fruit and he does it in a way that's unknown to us. So I don't have to understand it. We are weak. We are without strength. Uh, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He defends us in his own simple ways, but it's not impregnable. We can still be harmed. Things can still go wrong. But here's what we can't do. We can not use deception. We are not to be about any form of deception whatsoever as Christians. We cannot defend. It isn't our job if they start persecuting the church to actually get out and get guns and protect the church that way. It isn't our job to change who we are, to make decisions and make ourselves different so people would leave us alone. We are weak and it is our strength to be weak. If you'd like to be a part of a weak group of people, that actually turns out to be some of the strongest people on the planet, then you can repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized tonight, and we will honor you and do everything we can to help you. If you need to rededicate, won't you come if you need to while we stand, while we sing.